A John Ruskin sits and looks at nature. He questions nature, and he laments that the height of civilization was reached in the Middle Ages, when society, religion, and the arts expressed a common set of standards and values. He questions nature, and John Ruskin's answers shape much of the future of architecture, the Gothic Revival. The Gothic Revival um, was established. I mean, if you'd, it was considered in the 1860s, and people talked about it in this way, as the national style. Gothic was not a style, but a principle, a moral crusade. The very first medium, or the thing that God created first, let there be light, became essential to the crusade. Faith translated into soaring monuments of stained glass. The Gothic Revival put Heaton, Butler Payne into business. The Victorian age began when Princess Victoria of Kent became the Queen of England in 1837. It was to end in 1901. She'd reigned for 63 years, seven months and two days. It's estimated that 80,000 stained glass windows were created during the Victorian age. The single most important event for, or set of events really, I suppose it is, uh, for stained glass um, in the post-medieval period um, was the extraordinary and dynamic success um, of uh, the Gothic revival. We are accustomed to underestimate the immense influence that a determined individual can exert. The key player in 19th century stained glass was Augustus Pugin. Pugin wrote a book in 1836 named Contrasts, which said that Gothic was God's own architecture and it must be revived. With Gothic's revival, the future would be built literally and symbolically upon the medieval past. And that was a time of romance. The Gothic world turned on marvels, not on mathematics. Ruskin and Pugin looked to the Middle Ages as an image of organic community. Ruskin um, was very inspired by Pugin, uh, though he never admitted it. You see, Pugin was a Roman Catholic, and Ruskin was high Anglican. Uh, and Ruskin once said that he never read a word of Pugin. But it has been recently shown that Ruskin took extensive notes on Pugin, and to Pugin, newly converted to Catholicism, truth in Christian art required the Gothic. But to John Ruskin, to build Gothic became not a Catholic duty, but a moral one. They both agreed stained glass was essential in the revival of all Gothic buildings. It is 1855, and in England, all roads lead to Warwick. It is presumed that Heaton, Butler, and Bain all crossed paths at the William Holland Stained Glass Studio in Warwick, where it was said that 50 men in top hats would arrive every day to make stained glass. It is assumed that Clement Heaton went to work there in 1851. James Butler was raised in Warwick, and Robert Turnell Bain lived just four miles away. In London, the Great Exhibition of 1851 was held at the Crystal Palace. 24 stained glass companies showed glass in a structure made of glass, huge as the imagination of its time. Inside, at the medieval court, Pugin's ideas were everywhere. He was 39 years old only to live one more influential year. And it was in that year Clement Heaton moved to London. He met John Clayton and Alfred Bell, by 1856, they lived together. James Butler arrives in 1858. 
he partners with Heaton. Clayton and Bell eventually become the largest Victorian stained glass firm. But from 1859 to 61, they link with the technical whiz kids, Heaton and Butler. Only together can they make the turning point in stained glass happen. Clayton and Bell move to a new location in Regent Street, but they leave something valuable behind. Clayton's protege, Robert Turnall Bain. It seems he'd been poached. Heaton and Butler make R.T. Bain a full partner in 1862. These are the articles of partnership between Clement Heaton, James Butler, and Robert Turnall Bain, dated 26th of March, 1862 ink written on parchment running to at least three pages. The new partnership took Pugin's ideas to heart. They were to base their new company on clarity and assertiveness. The Gothic is a defiant form of architecture. So shall the new company be defiant. They began by having their own building designed. 14 Garrick Street was to be spacious big enough to handle tremendous growth, elegant so as to accommodate clients pulling up in coaches, top hats and gowns. The finest of sherry was served to the elite architects and the people they served. In London today, Covent Garden's 14 Garrick Street is not the hub of a stained glass empire, but the streets around the once prosperous concern remain much the same as in 1864 when it was first opened. Covent Garden has changed a bit, though. Gone are the giants of the 19th century stained glass industry, but not the lingering power of the glass itself, full of feeling and saturated with worship. The Middle Ages extend from the 5th century into the 16th. These were medieval times. All across Europe, for all of these centuries, there was one common bond, the Christian faith. If you were not baptized in the church, you could not be a member of society. The great churches always expressed an emotion, the deepest ever felt. The grand Gothic cathedral was man's best attempt to grasp the infinite. The broken arch, our finite idea of space. The spire pointing with its converging lines. The unity beyond space. The sleepless, restless thrust of the vaults, telling the unsatisfied, incomplete, overstrained effort of man to rival the energy, intelligence, and purpose of God. You see, those medieval craftsmen, they didn't bother them one little bit, that their work was, maybe as far as they were concerned, never going to be seen again. 100 feet above the ground. And yet their work was perfection in itself. Their work was truly for the glory of God. Somebody once, somebody once described um, stained glass to me, and no doubt she read it somewhere else, that what it is, is in effect is an interruption of light. The essence of glass as a material is transparency. Painting on glass is entirely different than painting on canvas. Your highlights in glass, for example, cheeks, forehead, stuff like that. That is actually the raw glass with no paint on it, or extremely little bit of paint, so that you get the strongest amount of light coming through there, and you just think backwards. You, you want to darken it down, you put more paint on it. You're holding back the light. That's what you're doing with painting on glass, because you're literally painting your light source. Unlike dense materials, glass is something we look through not at. But it's on, the, it's on the outer skin of a building, as it were, and yet it's not opaque like the brick and the stone. Um, it's, it's almost unique as an art medium in, work, in, in being um, propelled by transmitted light rather than reflected light, um, which is, I think, very interesting. So it's brought to life, if you like, by light. In the dark, there is no such thing as stained glass. If you go into a church at midnight, you won't see any stained glass. Nor could we find any stained glass on the moon. No mystery here, stained glass is brought to life by the atmosphere. There is no atmosphere on the moon. Part of the mystery is that the windows change during the day, uh, depending on how much sunlight there is on them. 
uh, depending on how much mist there is in the air, uh, depending on how dry the air is. So the windows look different constantly. I like windows that every time I see them, I see something I didn't see before. It changes all day long, all day long. Dante wrote, art is the grandchild of God. In 1839, the Cambridge Camden Society was formed. Its aim was to promote church building, and they seized the ideas of Pugin, saying that the true principles of church design were not matters of taste, but of holy science. The Camden Society called it ecclesiology. Their magazine took the name The Ecclesiologist, and with it asked why private houses were kept clean and comfortable when the house of God had been allowed to decay. They demanded new churches, Anglican citadels. What the Cambridge Camden Society did is say, yeah, we've got to build loads of churches, but these churches have got to be built in Gothic, and they've got to have stained glass in them. And they were a very powerful group. Almost all the architects who would lead Anglican church building in the quarter century after 1850, the years of high Victorian Gothic, joined the Cambridge Camden Society. And the architects which they support early on became the great successful architects. Early on, George Gilbert Scott is, is taken up by the Camden Society, and he becomes the biggest architectural practice in the country. Sir George Gilbert Scott had publicly proposed Gothic as the only style appropriate for all buildings. St. Pancras Station. Scott's faith was proved with this sublime structure, the Midland Grand Hotel. It was the terminus for the Midland Railroad, the very railroad that had allowed Heaton Butler Bain to market stained glass all over the country. Uh, the Gothic Revival as a whole and its extraordinary success and expansion um, uh, had at its, as, as its core, in fact, in many ways it couldn't have happened, had at its core the, the, the extraordinary expansion of the Victorian railway system, indeed the creation of the Victorian railway system. I mean, in 1830, um, there was just, I think, 32 miles of passenger carrying track in Britain. It was the railway from Manchester to Liverpool. Um, by 1850, there was five and a half thousand miles. England became the first industrialized society. In the 1851 Great Exhibition, there were 24 glass firms. One decade later, there were hundreds of stained glass companies. Let's not forget that to make money in the first industrialized society, you needed to industrialize. Uh, one of the main problems was through the division of labor. These firms operated a very slick industrial process, essentially, in order to generate the huge amounts of commissions that they did. They had to get the whole thing down to I was almost going to say a fine art. Well, that's exactly what it wasn't. It was an industrial process. Heaton Butler Bain was to become a giant by expansion and specialization within each department of stained glass creation. And certainly within the, the paint shops, uh, they, had, they subdivided their workforce again, and they had painters of heads, hands, and feet, uh, draperies, backgrounds, canopies, um, and inscriptions. And what it afforded them, uh, what it enabled them to do, was to maintain a quality of product which was inevitable. Eaton, Button and Bain, as with Hardman and, and many of the other firms, not only did stained glass, they would execute for you a whole scheme of decoration. So they would do painted decoration, frescoes and, and, and other wall paintings. Heaton, Butler, Bain also did sophisticated decoration in stone sculpture, marble pavements, and wall painting. Just like the spokes in a wheel, everything comes back to Pugin. He said that the entire church, from the windows to metalwork to the furniture, must speak the same language. From the 1850s onwards, church building in Britain as a whole becomes a great sort of ecclesiastical and design industry. At Heaton Butler Bain, Clement Heaton was the chief designer for all these other elements. He also handled the designs for all non-religious commissions. At Rochdale, he supervised the entire project. Well, at the moment, we're standing in the Mayor's Parlour, which is in the town hall in Rochdale, which is uh, in Lancashire, 
in England. And uh, this is quite a remarkable building when you figure that Rochdale was only about a mile and a half across when this building was built. Rochdale Hall was designed in the Gothic style by W. H. Crossland, and he designed with intoxicating elegance. While great medieval towns are known for their castles and churches, those which rose to greatness in the Industrial Revolution have their town halls instead. The glass of this fantastic place is well known. In World War II, Hitler proclaimed that upon his taking England, he would march into Rochdale and have all the glass back to Berlin. In 1866, when the foundation stone was laid, the grand structure was budgeted at 20,000 pounds. By the opening in 1871, money spent exceeded that by eight times. The mayor of Rochdale said, we cannot have beauty without paying for it. In the autumn of 1848, the celebrated pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood was begun. The leader, Gabriel Dante Rossetti. They were young men desiring the nobility of life through art. They worked with vibrant color schemes, and Heaton Butler Bain felt the influence. In one definition of Paraphyletism, my favored one, the one that has something to do with the coloration and attention to detail of the original Paraphyletic movement, um, the, the most truly Paraphyletic windows were, are really those by Heaton, Butler and Bain. And there's very little in any stained glass ever more distinctive than Robert Bain's design style of the 1860s. Working with R.T. Bain, Alfred Hassam in 1863 was awarded the Collar Prize by the Ecclesiologist. This only one year after the brand new firm won medals at the 1862 International Exhibition further empowered Heaton Butler Bain. At Banbury, 1864, R.T. Bain with Alfred Hassam claimed historical precedence. Not only did they create the entire church, but led by the commission of Sir Arthur Blomfield, the eminent 19th century architect and son of the Bishop of London, they had claimed that the beauty of things reflects the hand of God like a mirror. Robert Turnell Bain stepped up to the plate. He accepted the challenge to become one of the greatest stained glass designers of all time. He was 27 years old. I think that Heaton, Butler and Bain, certainly insofar as um, Bain's design tendencies went, um, would probably have moved in the direction of trying to sell the idea of windows that gave him scope to do rather gorgeous paraphyllite women, often sort of turning three quarters away from, from the angle of view and uh, giving us long locks of golden hair or something. He will have figures that are wholly turned away from you, from all, all, what you're looking at. They'll have lots of overlapping. The girl appears in many of his windows, often with a very sharp hairline. What about this girl, though? This particular girl, we can't see the face of, but it's the girl that reappears in many of his windows between 1859 and 1868. And as good tourists, because Heaton Butler Bain windows are in many, many countries, what shall we look for? Perhaps we should find ourselves a guide. Bain's work can really be differentiated from a lot of artistic other, uh, other artists by the uh, wide and deep ink lines, which were, of course, really drawn in the cartoons. Uh, these were more prevalent on the folds of the robes, especially on the sleeves and the lower garment. Um, his other trait was to make a gap between the fingers on, on, on hands and um, his other, one of his main other characteristics was a young girl with fair hair kneeling, with hair being drawn away from the either side of the face in a distinct edge line. Remember that R.T. Bain's love of glass was found in the 14th century. He was Pugin's dream, Ruskin's disciple, Rossetti's pupil. R.T. Bain could draw the hard face like no one ever had. The hard face painting was what the Gothic enthusiasts liked. He drew his designs with little shading, just hard, sweeping lines. And he drew with a feeling for emotion no one had ever seen before on glass. In the 1860s, Bain's work in a very dramatic manner with a, with a lot of hard face painting, a bit of shading as well. And his particular stylistic thing he, he does, no one else does, is big doughy eyes. All his figures have, have, these, have these great big, very expressive eyes, um, often with um, some sort of striking um, 
uh, pick ups on you know, creases and the areas actually around the eyes. And there are the little towns of Heaton Butler Bain, present in so many of their windows, often hidden, but not hidden, at Banbury. But if there is one thing that defines R.T. Bain, it is the folds in the clothing. The darkened split in the hand is totally unique to R.T. Bain. The special points in this particular window are the arm folds in white and uh, ink, uh, the hands with the opening between the fingers, the reappearance of the girl with the fair hair, the townscape with the spires and castellated fronts, together with the rainbow effect with Christ in the center, with the typical heads and the eyes that were typical of Heaton Butler and Bayon's work. They're almost proto-psychedelic is still the best way to describe them, I think. Color schemes of Heaton Butler and Bayon windows of the 1860s. The rainbow effect appeared in many windows which he produced, including windows when he was working for Clayton and Bell. The best thing about this particular window is its size and brightness and the way it it comes out at you and the features in it look as though they're living uh, with the top part where Christ is preaching to them. It is not the light of every man's religion, but the light of Christianity. And if Christianity had only one sword to wield, this surely would have been it. If anybody in the world could pick up that weapon, it was the magic of Heaton Butler Bain, for their windows had more grace, more beauty, more subtlety, more sadness, more grandeur than the world had ever seen. They created Gothic's promise. Well, it was in 1935 when I was a choir boy in the Church of the Holy Trinity at Selhurst that during the sermons, when I thought they were boring, but they weren't really, I looked at the windows in the church, and there was one that fascinated me. It was our Lord feeding the 5,000. In the tracery were two fishes and five barley loaves. And I sat and pondered, looking at those windows, how did those barley loaves and fish get into that window? This is a portion of that window from Sailhurst Holy Trinity. The window was removed from the church, and by chance, it is now to be found in the basement of London's Goddard and Gibbs, the very firm Jimmy Weatherby worked for most of his life. It was through that particular window that I've been able to have 53 years in the world of stained glass. So I owe it to that window and also to Heaton, Butler and Bain, that prolific Victorian firm in Carrick Street in London that produced these magnificent windows. It was 1942 I wrote for this brochure. I was only 17 then. So my desire to take stained glass windows up as a profession was beginning to manifest. The brochure arrived and I was absolutely thrilled to bits with it. So much so that I made myself a model church, roughly about that size. And with the illustrations, I cut the cardboard to fit the windows, so I had proper designs of windows in my model church that I had for years, and I was absolutely thrilled with it. Nine years ago, I retired, but I've been hooked back on special jobs, and especially the 40 windows to cut for Westminster Abbey because they were all traditional. It all stems from that lovely church at Selhurst because the windows were so wonderful. And it's been the windows of Heat and Battle and Bain have been my guidelines ever since. Without that inspiration, I don't think I would have taken the work up because it was only through that work that inspired me, um, which, uh, and the opportunity came at Goddard and Gibbs for me to do this work. 
And here's an anecdote. <laughs> he, he and Butler and Bain were entirely responsible for, for, for my being interested in 19th century stained glass. And in fact, I have a specific story based around the windows in Isleworth Church. Now, I'd seen enough at that time to know that this is by this wonderful artist who's I, who I'd seen before. And it was a church, I, I was with a colleague on the way back from the West Country somewhere. It's quite late in the evening. And we just diverted off to Isleworth Church, which was, as usual, locked. Um, and, but we, would, we saw these mystery windows and thought, well, let's knock the church warden up. Let's get him to open up this church. Very nice man was finishing off his dinner. His wife had made him in his little house there. And he said, uh, oh, no. Well, I got, we said, well, who's the artist of these wonderful windows? And please, can you let us in to see them properly from the inside? And he said, I can't tell you anything about them, except I do know, because I've been told by an expert, it's very bad glass. We were in his church about three quarters of an hour in ecstasies of delight. The church had several um, windows of the early 1860s by the firm I somewhat later discovered was Heaton, Butler and Bain. Uh, and we were just in ecstasies over these windows, telling this man whether some of the most wonderful things we'd ever seen, da da da. He went back to his house after three quarters of an hour. He gave us another cup of coffee and, and was obviously um, was somewhat taken aback, but then very interested in our wild enthusiasm. And at the end of the evening, he said, well, thank you very much. It's been wonderful to meet you. And, and now I can give people the correct information. It's very good glass. When Albert died in 1861, it was immediately thought there should be a memorial. There was a great debate about the form the memorial should take. And, um, it was decided that it had to be in the Gothic style, though Prince Albert was, didn't like the Gothic style. Built between 1863 and 1875, Sir George Gilbert Scott's climactic achievement, the Albert Memorial, is one of the defining statements of high Victorian Gothic. Its spire is 175 feet tall, an interpretation of a medieval shrine normally associated with the relics of saints, and it's typical of high Victorian idealism. The spire is covered with angels, and a 14-foot-tall bronze statue of Prince Albert forms the apex of a remarkable pyramid of sculpted figures representing the ideals, aspirations, and achievements of the Victorian age. By the time the memorial was completed, Queen Victoria was no longer staging medieval costume balls. High Victorian Gothic's love of effortful struggle was dying. G.E. Street's Law Courts was the last great Gothic public building built in London, 1882, the grave of modern Gothic. The triumphant expression of 19th century engineering was crystallized in one man, I.K. Brunel. The designer of the first transatlantic steamer, Brunel was the prolific builder of the sublime, the railroad stations and the bridges to support those trains. His bridges looked like structures from outer space. Working with the architect Richard Norman Shaw, the giant Brunel Memorial window at Westminster Abbey, designed by Henry Holliday, was made by Heaton Butler Bain. This window marked a major change in the company's style. The interesting thing is that at this time, Holliday was working mainly with James Powell and Sons. It may have been Norman Shaw, who um, seems to have worked closely with Heaton Butler Bain, and I was a personal friend of Heaton, who may have suggested this particular window should be made in the Heaton Butler and Bain workshops. If so, it led to an important partnership between Holiday and Heaton Butler and Bain for a number of years. In fact, Henry Holiday worked with Heaton Butler Bain for the next 15 years. I don't know if it was that Heaton Butler and Bain ended up with that look because of Henry Holiday or if Henry Holiday ended up with that look because he was involved with Heaton Butler and Bain. Holiday's style was not gothic. He designed with cooler colors and used classical figures. The aesthetic movement had begun. People had more money. The church began to lose its influence. After 1870, the rush to suburbia became a stampede. Some called it the domestic revival. Heaton Butler Bain embraced the shift in public taste. Keaton, Butler and Bain did understand something about, um, if you like, executing around 1870 a pioneering aesthetic movement, movement window, and those windows are the proof of that. 
With the new style came new medals for Heaton Butler Bain. In 67, Paris, 79, Australia, 81, America. And as they grew, they became the third largest stained glass company of all time. The windows were the talk of England, and their advertising brought all the success they could imagine. The company grew, and there were lots of company picnics. R.T. Bain's family grew, having five daughters and one son. He owned two homes. On the weekends, they were at Bourne End in the house called Roselands. On the streams that fed the Thames, there were little locks, and by the homes, families would float the punts, the flat bottom boats, down to the river. It was a time of prosperity and great peace. From the aesthetic movement dawned the arts and crafts movement, which flew in the face of industrialized England. The unique quality of goods, not mass-produced quality, became the object of effort. In America, the arts and crafts movement settled in with Louis Comfort Tiffany. He said that things of daily use, such as lamps and vases, reach a wider public than do paintings and sculpture, making the decorative arts more important to a nation than the fine arts. And Tiffany used a lot of stained glass. Tiffany's windows are layered, sometimes many pieces of glass deep. To see the back of a Tiffany window is like looking at craters of the moon. But the front is a rare beauty indeed. But Tiffany disappointed Clement Heaton Jr. By now, James Butler and Clement Heaton had their sons working for the firm. In order to sell to a wide public, Heaton, Butler, Bain in England and Tiffany in America used mass production techniques. Clement Heaton Jr. felt this to be a betrayal. Clement Jr. did not want the inevitable product that the family company had come to master. A few years earlier, his father, fascinated with the chemistry of medieval glass, had discovered the flux used by the medievals. He had created a special pigment of silicated flux based on a wheat straw ash. It was this development that allowed Heaton Butler Bain to work with 131 different colors. The medievals themselves had no more than 10. But Clement Heaton Sr. confided the secret of his discovery to members of his family only. He started a spin-off company called Heaton and Son, selling the colors to other stained glass studios. When he died in 1882, his son, Clement Jr., had become a successful supplier of stained glass materials. He claimed indestructible colors used by all of the leading glass painters in Great Britain. Running his own firm, supplying materials, made it easier for him to make a monumental decision. On January 13, 1886, Clement Heaton Jr. resigned his share of the partnership in Heaton Butler Bain. Clement Jr. was poetic and principled, but the firm flourished without him. Heaton Butler Bain began to sell heavily in New York. Gorham Company represented them in America all the way up till 1908. Afterwards, HBB maintained their own offices at 55 Fifth Avenue. R.T. Bain's son, Cato, joined the firm one year later, 1887. All of the firms wanted a royal appointment, but only to Heaton Butler Bain came the appointment to the Prince of Wales. The leading royal family in the world had selected Heaton Butler Bain as their stained glass masters. The year is 1536. The time is called the Reformation. The Catholic Church has just been outlawed in England by King Henry VIII. In 1536, stained glass was considered a Catholic art form. Uh, this whole art form suddenly became deeply unfashionable and indeed was, was regarded with with great hatred by the church reformers and the English cathedrals and many cathedrals and churches throughout Europe, Northern Europe especially, were vandalized and all their stained glass, or most of it, was smashed to bits. Whitby Abbey was smashed to bits in 1539. Whitby Abbey is where Bram Stoker wrote Dracula. Some of you may know it as Carfax Abbey. 
but Whitby has a horrifying and distinct past all its own. The 16th century was a rampage for stained glass. And then came the 17th century, new destruction to the glass of the ages. Clear, plain glass was the religion of its time. And in the 19th century, many a church could only afford partial restoration of the real glass, the true glass. Even in the 20th century, monumental windows were destroyed, not so much for political or religious reasons, but in the name of restoration and changing tastes. In his career, R.T. Bain designed four great Last Judgment windows. At Hanley Castle, he did so for Clayton and Bell. The damned were always held back by a chain, the tongues of fire lapping at their feet. At Kemsford, he shows us the devil. But there is one last judgment window we shall never see. Heaton, Butler, Bain were so proud of it, they included it in their advertising. The window is lost forever, and the blame must lay with the church at Ufton. They smashed the Heaton and Butler, yeah, you know, and there's almost no question that that would be saved. Oh, that hideous, garish, strange, and they couldn't begin to understand it on its own terms, Victorian window, we must take that and where we must remove it. What I find deeply shocking is that he also said this window should be removed and destroyed as though removing it from public gaze in the cathedral wasn't quite enough. It had to be hammered to bits. It had to be destroyed. Removal wasn't enough. It had to be literally smashed to bits. The genius of one generation is often found to be useless by the next. The medieval's antique glass and stained glass itself had become useless until the 19th century produced Charles Winston, a lawyer by trade whose life study was the technical side of stained glass. He asked James Powell at Whitefriars to work with his experiments and reproduce the real glass. You began to get the glass being made again in exactly the same way as the medieval glass was made. And that's why you've got this incredible rich color that began to be used because they started to fire the glass properly. Few companies in the world now produce antique glass. The greatest in America is to be found in Seattle, the home of much glass fame. To make a stained glass window, the entire process begins here with the making of the glass itself. In 1851, Clement Heaton was using Charles Winston glass made by James Powell, antique glass, the same technique used by the medievals. First, the molten glass is gathered on a blowpipe, blown to a bubble which the glass blower manipulates into a long cylindrical shape. The ends of the cylinder are cut off it is slit down one side and flattened into a sheet. It's amazing to think that the swinging of the hand-blown glass, the shaping, all the reheatings, the glass being made thinner and thinner, the coolings and then once again reheating, that they could drip water on molten glass, that using wooden tools in a blast furnace could produce the finest glass on earth. The flattening process is, by its very nature, fascinating. It's hard to imagine something so big and round could end up as a totally flat glass. It is with such sheets of colored glass that the art of stained glass window making begins. With this process, you can make solid color sheets of glass about one eighth inch thick. Or you can make what is known as flashed glass, same thickness, but essentially a laminated glass consisting of two colors on one sheet. Some colors, such as red, require this flashing. Ruby red is too dark a color for sunlight to be seen. Flashed red was a process discovered in the 14th century. So you've got basically a big blob of white glass, a thin layer of red on top, and then you blow it and the red stretches out really, really thin. Heaton Butler Bain used a lot of flashed glass. Any color could be eaten away by acid, revealing the white glass below. This here is flashed glass, which means you've got two colors on one piece of glass. So you'd, in this case, you've got a white 
and a light brown colour, but it's on one piece of glass. And you acid through the brown to get the white beard, as you can see here. Let's go back a bit. Once you have the glass, how do you make a stained glass window? First, you draw a small scale design in full color. A full size drawing called the cartoon is next prepared, generally in black and white. From the design, the full size figure is drawn out, following the design so that when the full size figure is complete, a sheet of tracing paper is put over the whole figure and the lead lines put in, which is these large black lines here, the center of which is the heart of the lead, and that is called the cut line from which the glass is cut. The glass to be cut will be selected for its color and its imperfections. The cutter looks for the virtue of uncertainty, the flaws, the streaks and bubbles that can best tell the story. The glass is then cut to the precise size of the cartoon pieces. The grosing tools are used to chip the glass to perfection. When the glass is cut, the glass is put over the full size drawing, such as this head here. The glass is put over that, and these lines are traced onto the glass from the drawing. Each piece of glass is assembled and labeled so that later the glazier can fit it into exactly the right spot. The precision of glass making is essential. It is time for the glass to be painted. The painting of details is done by using a black enamel pigment derived from iron. It is sometimes supposed that enamel painting on stained glass is a relatively late innovation, but this is a misconception. The technique is straight out of the Middle Ages. The painter was the king of the studio. He was always provided cigars when he showed up in the morning. He was given his retinue of, of apprentices to carry his coffee, to do whatever they wanted. A number of them were quite temperamental, but it was key to this, the, the style of, especially with Heaton Butler and Bain and Clayton and Bell, that were painted windows that they kept the head painter or the, the, the first-rate painter extremely happy. At Heaton Butler Bain, the glass painters were actually offered the same fine sherry that the prestigious clients were served. The glass can be assembled on a plate glass easel, temporarily mounted on glass held by beeswax, so it can be painted again with more detail before it's fired once again. Here we have uh, a head which has been uh, painted. Uh, the lines are traced on first of all, and then a matte of colour is put over the line. What I'm doing here is putting the, the painted detail on, the finishing touches to the, to the glass, lining over the, the tint that had, that had been put on beforehand. A brush is used to take out the highlights of the head, i.e. the different tones are then modelled into the mat, after which the head is put into the kiln and fired. This technique here is exactly the same as in Victorian times. Once the individual pieces of painted glass have been fired in a kiln, then the glazier can begin letting up the window, putting it all together. The lead separates all the different pieces of glass and, at the same time, holds them all together. The lead itself comes in six-foot strips called canes, and it's shaped like an H so the glass can be fitted. Canes have been made the same way for centuries. It is easily cut with a knife. He secures the glass and surrounds it with lead and finally solders the joints together. The lead is soft and eventually will fail. This is generally why windows need repair. Lead is what we call a stupid metal. It doesn't have any memory. And when it expands, it doesn't contract again. So if the sections of the window are too large or in too much extreme heat or badly designed or a combination of the above, then it starts to sag with a combination of wearing out 
because of heat and gravity. And, um, you know, all of us tend to sag a little bit as we get older. Windows do too. Once the window has been leaded up, it's then waterproof by pressing a putty solution under the leads. This seals the lead to the glass and is the last step. The window is now ready for installation. When a, a bishop was showing a group of children through a cathedral, and he was explaining all of these windows and, and therefore, therefore giving kids catechism, so to speak. And when he was finished, he turned to the children and he said to them, well, children, what is a saint? And one of the children immediately said, a saint is someone who God's light shines through. And here it is, the new and improved Heaton Butler Bane tie, sported by fashionable people everywhere in the UK. Don't let this one get away. Go out and get yours today. Have you seen my Heaton Butler Bane tie? I bought it at Lifton in Devon for only five pounds today. <laughs> Through the years, R.T. Bain's house style of design was followed by HBB's list of chief designers. A partial list of these great designers would include Charles Heen, Frederick Shields, Mr. Bladen, Hancock, Foddy, and into the 1930s with John Hutchins, and the final designer, Francis Minette. Francis Minette drew illustrations about his memories working for Heaton Butler Bain. One such was a Mr. Peterkin, he was a church interior painter, a flamboyant bohemian. Peterkin was painting a horizontal line on a church wall that RCB, on a progress visit, claimed was crooked. Have no fear, dear sir, exclaimed Peterkin. It'll dry straight. James Butler seems to have been not only the primary business partner, but a rather sentimental man. He named two of his eight children after his own partners and once retired, named his house in Kent after the town where he was born. Warwick House. Since 1887, the firm had been run by two butlers and one Bain. In 1921, new partnership papers included the two surviving Bains and now just one butler, Clement J. And two years later, he sells his share to Cato Bain. Now, till the end, the Bains control the company. The Bain family descended from Duncan, the first king of Scotland. Captain Richard Bain, Royal Navy, lived in the 1700s and was R.T. Bain's grandfather. By a curious coincidence, Captain Bain was the only person legally entitled to fly the crossbones flag at sea. It was actually part of their family coat of arms. His son, Richard Roscoe Bain, was the chief engineer to the East India Company and the architect for the Calcutta markets in India. R.T. Bain was born in 1837. His son, Cato, and grandson, Basil, would all become partners in the firm. R.T. Bain suffered a paralytic stroke when Cato was only 15 years old. Just two years later, Richard Cato Bain became part of the family business. Perhaps because of this overwhelming responsibility, Cato grew up without the boyish sense of joy. People who remember Cato Bain said that working at HBB was a stern experience. Basil Bain, the son of Cato and Gertrude Bain, was born in 1897. And just a bit like his father, joins the studio at the age of 17. One year later, his grandfather, Robert Turnell Bain, dies. It is 1915, World War I. Basil Bain becomes a camouflage officer, being one of six technical and experimental officers on headquarters staff at Kensington Gardens, London. He developed the camouflage to be used on the wings of the earliest warplanes. Later, Lieutenant Basil Bain created stage design for the Royal Military Attack Tournaments. But he had fallen in love with glass. And in his own words, it will always be my endeavor to expound the beauties of light and form for the benefit of others as my primary duty in the medium from which I derive so much happiness in its manipulation, glass. In 1930, Basil Bain made a breakthrough. Basil Bain developed the first mosaic and stained glass, and he had a patent. 
he patented the first resin bonding fuse glass technique, allowing a stained glass window to be made using no lead lines. One trade magazine went so far as to say, the process represents a new technique. It is also the first change that has taken place in the manufacture of stained glass in 12 centuries. But his father, Cato Bain, did not support Basil's experiments. As I became older, I realized that indifference, almost to the point of hostility, was by no means uncommon in relationships between father and son when engaged in the same business. Basil could draw eloquently, but after World War II, the times had changed again. There were few commissions. In Thornton Hugh, directly across from a window the firm had designed earlier, Basil Bain created a beautiful memorial in 1949, one of the last. In 1951, Basil married a charming Swiss woman named Simone. Only two years after marrying and just one year after the birth of his son Malcolm, Basil Bain died at the age of 56. And with Basil's death, so did the continuation of Heaton Butler Bain die. After nearly 100 years of business, one of the world's great stained glass firms vanished. Simone is a remarkable woman. Swiss-born, she taught herself the English language determined to raise her son in England. Now in her 80s, Simone lives in Monaco and is a tireless advocate of stained glass. She is the author of the most definitive book about Heaton Butler Bain. Malcolm Bain died in tragic circumstances at the age of 20. Simone Bain has always wondered if Malcolm might have found his way back into the brilliance of his family's business tradition, the world of stained glass. Malcolm's education was pointing him toward becoming an architect. He was an exceptional student, and from a very young age, he drew prolifically with great assurance. Now, we only have home movies of Simone and Malcolm together. The searching for and the joy of finding great stained glass is very much an adventure. The trail to find Heaton Butler Bain windows is rewarding. There are so many windows, it seems that every town has a story. In the village of Ganton, Reverend Disney Ledger Alexander has a memorial. About five years, four years ago, I got an email from um, a lady in America saying, you know, could she contact me? Did I know anything about this window? And it turns out that it was her great, 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 great grandfather who actually put the window in. And he was the son of Disney Ledyard Alexander. And it's so fascinating because his great, 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 great granddaughter actually came back last year to have her marriage blessed in this church. So that really was nice. It, it, all the pieces came together. So there's not a lot wrong with the internet. The entire town turned out for the Americans who were coming back to England for a proper ceremony. It was this Heaton Butler Bain window that brought them all together. The glass is in Mevagisi, and the glass is in St. Just in Roseland, and again in Penzance. In Banbury, Heaton Butler Bain made the exceptional Arctic window. Not only is it huge, but the details are all recreated from Admiral Sir George Back's personal sketchbooks. His ship, the HMS Terror, was wrecked amongst huge ice floes. The fight for survival is immortalized in the glass. When a window has a label, it is always found in the lower right corner, sometimes in block letters, sometimes in scrawl, and oftentimes very hard to read. And quite often, Heaton and Butler and Bain windows were signed. Actually signed not with a monogram, as many 19th century glass painters did, but actually their name, Heaton, Butler and Bain, at the bottom. But for the tourist, making it more difficult, most church windows are not signed. If, if a church, for example, bought a set, quote unquote, a set of Heaton, Butler, Bain windows, uh, they might sign one of them, which would be the signature for all of them. So what do we look for then in a heat and butter and bane window? We look for windows that were well executed.
We looked for windows that had the faces in particular and details aligned very much to glass of both the latter part of the 14th and 15th centuries. Heat and butler and bane windows are particularly finely crafted. The paintwork on them is absolutely superb. That's the special thing about being a painter is the feel of putting paint on paper. Well, on glass, it's even more special because you get the textures and the vibrancy of, of cutting out bits of colour. <laughs> Some of the greatest Heaton Butler Bain are their later windows. It's here at St. Stephen's, a small church in the heart of Manhattan, we find the greatest single collection of Heaton Butler Bain in New York City. Gone is R.T. Bain's girl, but not feminine beauty. Bain's early work created raw emotion, but the later work touches the heart. When St. James was built on Madison Avenue, it was surrounded by fruit trees. Upper Manhattan was still out in the country. The two giant windows inside are Great Heaton Butler Bain. Trinity Cathedral in New Jersey hosts extraordinary windows by the Americans Tiffany and Lafarge, with grand English windows by Clayton and Bell, and of course, Heaton Butler Bain. Trinity Church would not have been built at all had it not been for a thunderstorm. It was Colonel Josiah Ogden who saved his wheat crop by missing the Sabbath church service. And after his censure in 1742, he began building a new and more tolerant church. Back in England, on the outskirts of London, Southfields offers us a window made in 1927. It is a gem, profoundly simple. The word beauty comes up often when reading the papers of Heaton Butler Bain. These were men who loved the beauty of glass and the manipulation of glass to create forms of light unequaled in the history of man. And we must end this brief adventure again near London at Austerley. Well, the Austerley windows, I think, are probably the most or one of the most impressive sets of the, the very best period of Heaton, Butler and Bain's work, particularly the East Window, which is outstanding by any standards. We end at the beginning, gazing at the earliest works of Heaton, Butler, Bain. Early 1860s windows offer us all the promise, all the courage, and all of the hope of all of the ages.